Hi. Um, so if I had known that there was somebody going to talk about introduction to no bad, I'd have just called this introduction to no good. Okay, so this is the agenda for today. Um, the first thing I'm going to start with is IP. And IP is just good enough. It was not well architected. It was not worked out in detail. If you look at the ISO model and, you know, these wonderful seven layers and everything fitting nicely, it's not quite the same as IP. You have the network. You have the transport. Then you've got stuff below and you've got stuff above. And it's just supposed to work. And it doesn't always line up nicely. But the big thing is we didn't want, well, I shouldn't say we because I had no part of that. But the guys who did it um, said, we can't predict the future. Let's just make it reasonable, flexible, and extensible, and um, just deal with things as they happen. I'm sure, you know, talk about DDoS today. Nobody thought of this 15, 20 years ago. Um, the fact is, if you build it good enough and, and you keep your options open, then you can deal with the changes that occur. And I mention this because in a, in a little while we get to a different way of doing things that, um, well, we'll get there. So IP started off, the big apps in IP were email a long time ago, and simple data services like FTP and news. And now you've got all sorts of funny, thing, funny stuff happening on it. You've got the web, you've got voice with its real-time requirements, you've got video, very large amounts of traffic, small amounts of traffic that need to get there, Absolutely. You've got SLAs and grades of service. You know, you've got classes and, and, and quality and everything. So IP is just good enough, and the IP control plane is also just good enough. The key is it's flexible, extensible. We did DB routing for a long time. While it was good enough, it was good enough. And when it wasn't, we did link state. Now people ask, um, is convergence in just a few seconds good enough? And, you know, the answer is, well, if you need it in sub-seconds, we'll get there. Because the key is good enough can get better. If you want fast convergence, sub-seconds, you can get there. If you want ultra-fast, you want to do it in 50 milliseconds, because, you know, it's a magic number, we can get there, too. People are talking about bulletproof IP, and so we have a bunch of uh, work in the IETF on the IGP front, on the BGP front, um, talking about hitless restart. The router goes down, comes up, and keeps going, and no one knew the difference. You've got business IP saying, look, we need stuff to make us money and not to lose us money. And we, we can get there. So that's IP. There's a different way of doing things. That's ATM. Let's do everything, and let's do it perfectly. Let's anticipate, you know, put everyone in these five adaptation layers and say, this is how everything lines up. Let's just do it right. And it's a, it's a big philosophical mismatch of IP. People talk about, you know, IP and uh, ATM and integrating them and stuff. And the, the first thing you have to re realize is they're trying to marry two different philosophies. So if ATM is frame relay on steroids, which I've heard often, then MPLS is ATM on happy juice. And, and the basic idea is it has to be just good enough. And there are plenty of people out there who are trying to make it perfect. And the IETF and at least some people in the IETF are saying, no, don't go there. It's an IP control plane. It's an IP philosophy. So what, you know, what is MPLS? MPLS is basically three things. Tunnels. See, I can't count. Never mind. It's, it's tunnels, it's explicit routing, and it's a label stack. Layer 2 independence I only bring up because of ATM. IP is also layer 2 independent. But in, in a lot of situations, it's important to be layer 2 independent. So why do you want tunnels? Well, if you cannot IP route, so you have non-IP packets, and you want to get them from point A to point B, you need a tunnel. And if you can IP route, but there's private IP addresses, um, you probably want to use tunnels there. The other reason is that you don't want to IP route. 
And that people who talk about the BGP free core, just because BGP is this complex protocol and there's lots of stuff going on. So maybe you want to run BGP on the edge and you don't want to run it in the core. And the other thing is multicast, and I shouldn't make fun of multicast, but a lot of people don't want to run native multicast in their cores. So, how can you do tunnels? Well, if you're MPLS, you can do LDP. And if you're IP, you can do IP in IP, which is you know, IP in IP. Or you can do GRE, which is more general, general purpose. You can do IPsec. And there's this thing that I'm not supposed to know about called UTI. And an important question is when you're doing tunnels, can a single tunnel from point A to point B do multiple things? So there's this notion of a tunnel demultiplexer. If you have to build a, a different tunnel for every use that you have to put it to, it could get unscalable pretty quickly. But if you have a single tunnel from point A to point B and say everything that wants to get from A to B uses this tunnel and I have this other field inside the tunnel that says you know, what service I'm actually doing, that would be very useful for scalability. So let's, let's you know, I'm kind of assuming that you, I mean, introduction to no, no good is one thing, but I'm assuming you know something about MPLS. Um, if you do LDP tunnels, you have a small header. The LDP, uh, the MPLS header is like four bytes. And if you do IP, it's a little bit bigger. And it might not be an issue, but it's, it's a difference. Um, you have label stacking in MPLS, and you have no stacking in um, IP. Now, it might not be a huge deal because you do have protocols like um, GRE that can carry MPLS within them and inherit a label stack. And you have protocols like UTI, which can carry a demultiplexer. And if you don't need a, a big whole stack, but you just need a tunnel and a demultiplexer, then UTI would be fine. Um, you also need signaling for the DMUX. You need to say at both ends, you know, I'm using this DMUX, DMUX field, you know, value five for this service. And there is no signaling in IP yet, but there is work in the PWE3 working group in the ITF on this. Um, one thing about LDP is you get these automatic tunnels. You just tell every, all your edge routers, run LDP, and you get tunnels everywhere. And you, in IP, so far, the tunnels are configured. And this is not a huge problem because you can fix it, but right now it's an issue. Uh, with great difficulty, LDP tunnels follow IP routing, and it's kind of trivial for IP to follow IP routing. Right now, maybe because people haven't thought about it and worked on it, um, MPLS is hard to spoof, but IP is clearly spoofable. MPLS has no data security. Um, IPsec is, can be used if you want tunnels with security. So the bottom line on tunnels is you don't need MPLS for tunnels, but they have some nice properties. And so you need to sort of sit back and decide for yourself. What's the cost of deploying a new protocol such as LDP, and what are the benefits I get? The other thing that MPLS has is explicit routing. And you could use this for traffic engineering, fast reroute, guaranteed bandwidth, and probably a whole bunch of other uses. Now, in, when I was um, suggesting that I give this talk, um, you know, somebody asked me, how much truth are you going to tell? It's a very good question. So I decided all of you guys need three handfuls of salt, and you need the first handful right now. It's my claim that connection-oriented paradigm fits nicely with IP's connection listeners. Take this with one handful of salt. So people ask, is ATM a good way of doing traffic engineering, or is it MPLS, or can we just do it with IP? And the first question you should really ask is, do I need traffic engineering? If I need traffic engineering, where in my network do I need it? Do I need it in the core? Do I need it edge to edge? Do I need it end to end? Don't go there. But um, that's actually the first question. And it's, e it's too easy to get sucked into answering what's the best way to do it if you don't you know, ask whether you need it in the first place. You're going down the wrong path. But suppose you say you do need it. The first thing you have to do is figure out how you put your your traffic onto your physical topology. And to do this, you measure traffic patterns, and then you crunch it through some um, fancy uh, program, usually in Perl. 
and uh, you figure out where things need to go. And then the second thing is you have to convince the packets to follow the great plan that you just made. So you can do this with BGP. You can do this with IGP by playing with metrics. Or you can do it by source routing, which is the way a lot of people did with ATM and frame relay. And the new thing you can do is with MPLS. Again, this is the second handful of salt that you need. Um, fine grained traffic engineering needs some form of source routing. And one of the things, if you do source routing, one of the things you get is you can change um, it's a given flow without changing anything else. Because you say, from, from point A to point B, I want you to take this path, and then you change that to a different path, and you haven't affected any other traffic. Whereas if you do things like play with metrics, you have to be very careful that the change that you made affects just the route that you did and not all the other paths for your network. And this applies uh, even more when you have a link failure. So source routing helps, and source routing is, um, is, is useful. There, has, there was a paper some time ago about using linear programming to go from a traffic pattern, traffic matrix that you have, to metrics on your links. And this is my back of the envelope ca calculations of what it would take to, to actually run that linear program. You've got n squared city pairs. You set up an n squared by n squared matrix. It's already looking a little big now. You do matrix multiplication. Well, that's n to the sixth now. And then if you actually run simplex for doing linear programming, you need a lot of matrix multiplication. So you end up with a fairly large problem. Now, I might have gotten my numbers wrong, but it's a pretty large problem just to figure out what metrics you need to put on your links. And when you're done with this, it says, oh, we have this little problem. We have something called loop routes, or some such thing, which uh, loopy routes, I think, was the term they used. And uh, you can't deal with that, but uh, you don't need to deal with it. So my take is, and this is, you know, like I said, handful of salt. Um, you want source routing, and it's much easier to say you, you run your magic program that says how to map your traffic onto a physical topology, and then you just say these are the explicit routes. I'm done. You don't go through a second step that says compute a whole bunch of metrics and put them on your routers. Oh, by the way, a link went down, compute a new set of metrics, put them on your routers, and these are non-trivial computations. Another thing you could use explicit routing for is fast readout. And as usual, the questions come, you know, can MPLS read out as fast as Sonnet, which is 50 milliseconds? Can IP read out as fast as MPLS? And, and you've lost track of the problem. The first question is, do you really need 50 milliseconds? And it depends what data, what traffic you're carrying. Well, once you get over that and d define how fast fast is, um, the question then you ask is, can I read out quickly? without, you know, turning my network into a porridge. And the third question is, if I do all these things, uh, how well does it scale? If you do fast readout with IP, and there are efforts to do this. Thank you. Um, all nodes must be told a failure, because all nodes must reconverge. And um, the next slide will show you why. You, so, so that all nodes need, uh, all nodes learn of the failure, you need fast propagation and fast SPF triggers, which means you have to worry about stability. If a link is flapping up and down, you need to be very careful how you damp that. But if, when you're done, you're done. When all nodes are reconverged, you're done. That's it. The um, fast readout techniques with MPLS, um, the nice thing about that is only the two ends of the nodes of the link that fail need to know that it's down. So you don't need any signaling. And it's a local operation to detour the um, traffic onto a separate path. So it's a lot more stable. But it is a two-step process. This is a quick fix. This is a band-aid. And when you're done with this, you want your IGP to converge. And once the IGP converges, then you want to remove the band-aid. Um, the, the thing that I want to say is, if you take this very simple network, you've got ABC and you've got these link metrics. If the link between A and B goes down, if A uh, redoes the SPF without the link uh, A to B, it decides to send packets to C. 
But if C hasn't reconverged yet, it'll send the packets right back to A. So the so everyone needs to be on the same page when it comes to um, fast reroute using IP. Whereas if you did fast reroute with MPLS, you'd have an explicit path from A to B through C, and the packets would just go to B without going via C. I mean, without being IP routed at C, so they wouldn't come back to A. So, um, guaranteed bandwidth is a service that a lot of people have offer at layer two, and it's a service that you might want to offer at layer three. And again, the first question is, do you need it? But if you do, and this is the third handful of solved, you need source routing, you need call admission control, and you need some way of signaling this. RSVP could, can, can do this, and it remains to be seen how well. I'm sure ATM could have done it better. There's a whole bunch of services that are called MPLS services, and the first one is IPVPNs, which is a big favorite here. And then you have layer two transport, layer two VPNs, transparent LAN services, which um, is a new subject that a lot of people are talking about. And you have TDM over MPLS over TDM over, people get a bit carried away at points. There's actually this wonderful um, draft that you should read about how you transport electricity using photons. Um, the thing about all these is they're not really MPLS services, they're really tunnel services. But the problem is the MPLS geeks were responsible. Sorry. Um, some of these services are enhanced by source routing. So, for example, we talk about layer two transport or layer two VPNs. You might want to say guaranteed bandwidth along with that. And this is why, you know, at the front of the slide, I said this um, services double espresso. You might get more revenue. You might be more jazzed coming to work, or you could also stay up at night worrying about these things. So, revenue—that's what it's all about, right? Um, RFC 2547. I'm, I'm really glad Randy's not here. Um, it's a new service, and it's a very recent deployment. We don't know whether it'll make money or not. And the question for you guys is, do we give it a shot, or do we run like hell? And you know Randy's answer. And a lot of people are saying, no, we just wait. Let someone else suffer, and then we'll figure out how we jump in. Layer 2 VPNs is a slightly different story. It's an old service. There's lots of revenue, lots of deployment. The question is, if you put this over a new transport, is it good enough? We won't give you the same uh, service as a pure frame relay network would or a pure ATM network would, but is it good enough? And the same question for all, all the services that you could think of. I mean, is it worth putting this in your network? Will it give you revenue? And what's the cost in terms of um, transitioning your network? Points to ponder. Can good enough IP stay ahead of the curve? Can it get better, better fast enough to deal with all the uh, stresses put on it? Fast convergence, new services, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not here to tell you yes. I'm not here to say no. Personally, I think it, it will, but it's a, it's a question that you guys have to answer for yourself. But the other question is, even if it can, can MPLS help? Is MPLS a support or is it a crutch? Or is it a banana peel in the way of IP? And I'm not here to say, I'm, I'm just here to raise the question for you guys to answer. Is connection-orientedness a useful addition to connectionless IP? Like I said, you know my opinion, you have the crystal of salt, go for it. The other big question is what other services should you offer, if any, when, and how far should you go? So having given you this talk, um, you need to know where I'm coming from. I'm a vendor. For a lot of people, that means a lot. MPLS geek, protocol free. ATM, I don't particularly like or dislike. IP rules, and IP control plane especially rules. But I'm reasonably agnostic. Pay me enough, and I'll do it for you. <laughs> Questions? Just one uh, clarification. Uh, you had uh, a slide, I don't know if you want to page back really fast, that had the comparisons of uh, um, MPLS and IP tunnels or something like that. Sure. Back, 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 back. back. I'll, get, I'll get there. Oh, I think you passed it right there. Um, I think when you were talking about signaling for DMX and no signaling yet, you mentioned um, PWE3. PWE3. 
is developing a signaling of some sort for tunneling, and that's actually a little incorrect. It's not charted to do so. It's not charted to create any new signaling for setup of tunnels. Um, so you want to go out and itf.org and, and read that. And also, in general, um, as far as uh, tunneling technologies, uh, running over IP, there's a number that have been using signaling for some time. Um, this isn't something that's particularly uh, unique to NTLS. Are you talking about L2TP? Well, this is one. Okay. I don't know if you see the L2TP stamp on my head, but mobile IP uses signaling and it does IP tunneling. Um, L2TP, of course, does signaling and it's got label kind of things. Um, you could probably think of some more that also that have been defined in the IETF that have some sort of a signaling associated with the setup of the tunnel. So I should add L2TP to that. IPsec is one. There is signaling set up with the tunnel. I mean, uh, maybe it's more focused on uh, policy and such, but there's definitely a signaling plane. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, that's just a little bit misleading there. I don't know if it's, um, it's, it's a small point maybe in your overall uh, presentation here, but I didn't want to. No, it's actually, idea. thank you for pointing that out. I, I tend to forget about L2TP. <laughs> and um, the signaling for DMARCs that I was talking about was to separate services. So maybe IPsec could be made to do the same. Um, I ha I'd have to look at that. But that's a very well, we're just talking about uh, uh, oh, the yeah, signaling, was tunneling for signaling is, is something that has certainly been around for a while for tunneling protocols that run over IP, including L2TP. But yeah. I didn't want to run up here and just start okay. waving an L2TP flag that maybe some of those that, that know me probably thought I was going to do. Okay, thank you. I agree that uh, creating the geometry that you put on a network that's just an IP network without MPLS can be complicated. And I'm surprised, frankly, that to date there hasn't been more research about how to sort of do heuristic applied algorithms to do that. Um, that's also why the bandwidth trader's dream of turning up OC48s in 10 minutes and just plugging it into your network, you know, isn't really coming about. One of the things that confuses me about MPLS is um, tunnel placement. How do you figure out how to configure that? Because it seems that a lot of um, that is just as art and you know heuristics in the human mind as putting the geometry on the underlying network. In particular, um, the worry that I have is that people will place tunnels based on what the traffic normally is, what the flows normally are, and when you actually have outages, how do you actually know what the flows will be? And it seems that in some ways, basic IP with the standard geometry problems that we're all familiar with um, might deal better than that. It might deal better with those types of situations. And I haven't really seen a lot of, um, I'll say, intelligent analysis about what happens in times of failure with the problems of sort of humans just placing tunnels, you know, heuristically. Um, one of the things you can do with IP, so, um, um, sorry, with MPLS, is when you, when you define if you're using tunnels for, uh, for traffic engineering, you basically know, you know where it starts and where it ends, and you, you want to know how to place it on your physical topology. So what you do is you sit down and figure out where to put the traffic in the best case where all your links are working, and then you figure out an alternate path where any of the links there fail. And you can flip from one to the other. Did I not hit your question? I guess let me just give an applied example. Um, I want to build an OC48 from LA to Chicago because I have peers that I preference in Chicago and I happen to be sending them lots of traffic. My physical topology actually stays the same, but the provider is having a med problem and I honor med, so they're having a more specific problem or they're having some problem and the circuit goes down and I need to now send a lot of my external traffic to Seattle. But I didn't actually know that because my flows don't normally go that way. Um, but meanwhile, I've just reserved potentially a huge amount of bandwidth to Chicago for something that I'm not actually talking to in Chicago. And it seems that that kind of regression analysis often isn't done or there is no sort of methodology around that just as there is. And, and in situations like that, in some ways, the sort of gross geometry and the way that IP works handles that better. So that, that, that's a, an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. I understand. Um... I'm not sure that IP handles it better because you know, you, everyone just runs to the shortest path and you get congestion. But it's definitely something we should look at in, in the context of MPLS. Um, 
I think we should also look at it in the context of IT. But you just have so much less control in IT. Anyone? I'm sorry. Um, I think we've got a question. I'm sorry. Um, I, well, keep that on. Oh, well. Um, I did have an observation um, that, that there was uh, there's not only signaling, there was beneath that it was autom automatic tunnels. And again, since there's been signaling on IP for a long time for tunnels, there's been automatic magic tunnels for some protocols. And then it, what it boils down to when you do the comparison, the one that is very significant, you have down at the bottom there's security or no data security. Then there's a hard to spoof under MPLS. Yeah which spoof under IP, so there's, there's a couple of uh, differences there. And then it becomes at the top, there's, there's header differences. And then the stuff in the middle really isn't that much different. It's kind of like header differences. And spoof and hard to spoof, that's uh, someone that knows a whole lot more about security can probably come in there and tell me exactly why MPLS would be impossible to spoof. I, no one said impossible. <laughs> but the other thing is you, you could, Depending on how you, what you use MPLS for in your network, you could, you could say, I don't allow any MPLS traffic into my network. So MPLS is purely local to your network. Whereas, you know, if you said you're not letting any IP traffic into your network. Well, well then you're, you're classifying a type of traffic, and I can do that with filters as well yeah. on IP. Sure. And it just, it's, uh, maybe the spoofing has to do with in order to, to send traffic, you've got to go through a signaling stage to set it up. And whether with IP you don't um, necessarily. Uh, so it's, it's not it's not a question that IP is impossible to make spoof or MPLS is impossible to spoof. The question is it's a it's a matter of degree of difference. MPLS right now is is hard to spoof and IP is is easier to spoof. And the the thing is you have to let IP traffic into your network, so you have to do a lot more work to to detect spoofing. Whereas for MPLS, the easy thing is to say, not, I don't let this come into my network. As for control traffic, you know, you have all kinds of techniques to prevent, um, you know, MD5 authentication or whatever. So that the signaling stuff doesn't come in, you know, because that's, that's a lot different. Yeah, okay. Well, this can, of course, be taken offline, but sure. it just seemed to me that it kind of boiled down to headers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <was> okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you.